This is going to be a study on some of the scariest locations described in scripture. People are obsessed with being scared. They will go to haunted houses, out to see horror movies, and do anything to give their flesh a thrill. But they won't sit down and read the Bible that actually warns people and tells stories that really are scary. And that really should put fear in you. The Bible speaks of fearing God, and fearing God is a good thing. In regards to salvation, if you're saved, you have nothing to fear when it comes to salvation. God hasn't given us, us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. But having a good, healthy fear of God is a good thing to have. The Bible says Noah was moved by fear to build the ark. Jude one twenty three says, And others save with fear, pull, pulling them out of the fire. And this is going to be a study that will make you fear God and His power. The first one of these scary locations that I'm going to tell you about is the earth during the flood. One of the scariest locations described in scripture would be the earth during the time of Noah's flood. Keep in mind that it had never rained before this time. Genesis 2.6 says, But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So you had no rainfall. Only a mist went up from the earth to water the ground. Imagine if you had never seen water fall from the sky and how scary it would be to be caught out in the rain. People trying to get out of the area where they were wouldn't even be able to see in front of their faces because windshield wipers hadn't even been invented. There was no need for them. There was no need for umbrellas, so they had none. No rain boots, life jackets, water goggles, scuba diving outfits, surfboards, or jet skis. The only way out was to get in the ark. And there wasn't a building high enough to escape the flood, or a high hill or a mountain high enough. Genesis 7:19 says, And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. They couldn't run far enough away to escape the rain. Everywhere they went, a rain cloud followed them. Even the guy that had gills from the movie Waterworld would have died if he rejected Noah's warning. No one would be able to escape. Even Aquaman, if he were real and lived in, would have drowned. When God wants you dead, you're dead. So all the God-hating, Jehovah-rejecting, ungodly men perished in the flood. Second Peter 2.5 says, And spare not the old world, but save Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. The animals that didn't board the ark drowned right along with the humans. And that's how much God cares about animals, or animal rights. God probably thinks PETA or PETA is stupid, however you say that. And Genesis 7.21 says, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth and every man. Genesis 7.22, All in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. God doesn't care about animal rights. All of these people are yelling for animal rights, but yet they will kill an unborn baby. God calls this unnatural affection. You're just weird and unnatural if you care more about a walrus than an unborn baby. But all the animals died, and every living thing on dry land that didn't get on the ark died. Imagine hearing the thunder and seeing lightning for the first time. The Bible says that the earth was full of violence during the time before the flood. No doubt during this time people were parading around in wickedness, and God decided it was time to rain on their parade. And the people who didn't have enough sense to board the ark missed the boat because they didn't have enough sense to get in out of the rain. Noah probably stood in the cities with a street preaching sign that said a flood is coming, yet people didn't fear God or listen to the preacher, but when darkness covered the sky, it was too late. We learn from this story that even though God is long-suffering, God's patience runs out eventually. The next scary location described in the Bible is in Sodom and Gomorrah when God brought the fire down. Imagine being a wicked Sodomite during that time back then and notice I said wicked. The first time the word sinner is used in scripture, it is used along with the word wicked and it refers to Sodomites in the verse. 
Look at Genesis 13, 13. It says, But the men of Sodom were wicked, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Also notice it is in Genesis 13 and verse 13. And you have to watch out for the 13s because it is the number of rebellion in your King James Bible. The Bible says God is a consuming fire. And when you play around with sin, you are tempting God. And in a sense, you are playing with fire. There was one righteous man in Sodom named Lot. It says in 2 Peter 2, 7, And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. 2 Peter 2, 8, For that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And the angels warned him in Genesis 19, 15, about being consumed in the iniquity of the city. This was probably a 24-7 gay pride parade where it wouldn't be safe to walk down the street with your kids. And Genesis 19, 1 through 4 says this, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold, now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. But they And they said, Nay, but... We will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly and turned in unto him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast and did bake and leaven bread and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. The Sodomites were so wicked that they wanted to have sexual relations with the angels. Obviously, they didn't know they were angels because the angels looked like 33-year-old males. Also, notice that it was both young and old that wanted to lie with the angels. And you know things are getting bad when young kids are sodomites. Just like you see when you go anywhere today to a mall or the store, you can see two teenagers of the same sex holding hands and sharing a milkshake. God decided that the cup of Sodom was full. And it was time to rain fire on their gay pride parade. Not only was Sodom a scary place to be, but it makes it even scarier when you aren't right with God. The only one to call on for help is God. And if you want to have someone to call on in times of trouble, then you need to stay right with God. That way when it's trouble comes, you're already right with Him. And the next uh, scary location in the Bible we're going to talk about is Egypt during the plagues. What if you woke up one morning and turned on the faucet and blood filled your glass? When Pharaoh hardened his heart, God turned the water to blood. Exodus 7:19 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying to Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Unless you were a vampire or something, then you wouldn't want to drink this water. And even then, the Bible says the water stunk. It caused all the fish to die, so the Egyptians couldn't even go fishing on the weekend. And to top it off, the next few weeks, they were plagued with frogs, lice, and flies. Not only this, but Exodus 9, 6 says, And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died. But of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. This shows once again how God cares about animal rights. He doesn't care. He killed an animal just because of Pharaoh's hard heart. God put animals here for different reasons, mainly for us to eat and hunt. In Acts 10, 13, God said to Peter, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. You're not supposed to be mean to animals, but the life of an animal really isn't that important. You aren't supposed, supposed to treat a puppy like you would a human baby. So don't spend money microchipping your dog. If he runs away, just get another dog. But not only this, in Exodus 9, 8 through 12, it talks about God bringing boils on the Egyptians. They were probably scraping themselves with a potsherd like Job did in chapter 2 and verse 8. And not only this, but the weather was terrible. Exodus 9, 18 through 19 says, Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hell, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof even until now. Send therefore now, and gather thy cattle, 
than all that thou hast in the field for upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home the hell shall come down upon them and they shall die so they had hell they had frogs lice flies water was turned to blood then as you know he also brought swarms of locusts on the egyptians in exodus 10 13 it says and moses stretched forth his rod over the land of egypt and the lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night and when it was morning the east wind brought the locusts and the locusts went up over all the land of egypt and rested in all the coasts of egypt very grievous were they before them there was no such locusts as they neither after them shall be such and there was also a plague of darkness the darkness was so heavy it could be felt exodus 10 21 says and the lord said unto moses stretch out thine hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And this is definitely one of the scariest places described in Scripture. And it also points to another even scarier place in Scripture, which is also on earth, on earth during the time of Jacob's trouble. This time is often referred to as a time of darkness. And many people refer to it as the Great Tribulation. All the stuff that happened in Egypt is going to happen again. And you just might get caught in the middle of it if you don't believe the gospel for salvation. The gospel found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. How Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. But remember how God turned the waters into blood? He does it again in the time of Jacob's trouble. It says in Revelation 16, 4, And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. Not only this, but the fish also die like they did before. Revelation 8, 8 says, And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea that had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed if you're planning on missing the rapture don't plan on taking a cruise or anything involving water but you see how pharaoh was a type of the antichrist and the plagues were just a picture of what would take place in the future during the time of jacob's trouble remember how god brought the plague of frogs there is another set of frogs during the tribulation to come revelation 16 13 says and i saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet during the time of jacob's trouble unclean spirits and every evil thing that is against god is going to be bringing all out hell on the earth the book of revelation also talks about every foul spirit and every unclean and hateful bird which birds represent unclean spirits they will be dominating in the tribulation and not only this but the hell also comes back in revelation 16 21 it says and there fell upon men a great hell out of heaven and every stone about the weight of a talent and men blasphemed god because the plague of the hell for the plague thereof was exceeding great remember the locusts in exodus a different kind of locusts show up in the tribulation if you look at revelation chapter 9 verses 1 through 11 it says this and the fifth angel sounded and i saw a star fall from heaven into the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit and he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power and it was commanded that they should not hurt the grass of the earth neither any green thing neither any tree but only those men which have not the seal of god in their foreheads and to them it was given that they should not kill them but that they should be tormented five months and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man and in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold and their faces were as the faces of men 
and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the he Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. The man who caused Pharaoh so much trouble, which was Moses, also makes an appearance in the time of Jacob's trouble. He is the one he is one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. But imagine being on earth be, during that time period where you'll have locusts, darkness covering the earth just like it did uh, in the days when Moses brought the plagues. If you read about the time of Jacob's trouble in the Bible, it's a time of darkness. But you don't want to go through that time period. You want to get saved. And get raptured out before that time period comes. But the next scary location in scripture. Would be. Next to Korah. During his rebellion. Let's read numbers 16, 31 and 34. It says. And it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words. That the ground clave asunder that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses. And all the men that appertained unto Korah. And all their goods, they and all that appertained to them, went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them. For they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. So Korah went against Moses. And by doing this, he went against the Lord and provoked the Lord to anger. Korah sowed discord among the brethren, and in Proverbs 6, 19, God says he hates those who sow discord among the brethren. Ever seen all these video clips of the earth falling out from under cars and houses? Imagine witnessing firsthand Korah and all that appertained to him falling alive into the pit. And this is the same fate of the beast and the false prophet who are cast alive into the lake of fire, as it says in Revelation 19:20. And many people have a fear of falling. Imagine being in a situation where you could have fell alive into the pit with Korah. Notice the people in Numbers 1634 were crying out of fear because they didn't want the earth to swallow them up as well. And Proverbs 166 says, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. But the children of Israel still murmured against Moses. And they said that he had killed the people of the Lord. So all the people who blamed Moses for Korah's death received a plague from God. And this is a good warning to you that you can't go against God and go against his plan. Because his wrath will come out. He's not just a God of love. He's also a God of wrath. And then Isaiah 14.15 says this. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. To the sides of the pit. And Korah is said to be falling alive into the pit. And this brings to our next scary location in the Bible. Which is hell. And hell is also referred to as a pit. And Matthew 16, 18 says it has gates. And I'm sure you can imagine what they might look like. Jonah described hell as having bars. 1 Peter 3, 19 calls it a prison. Luke 16 describes it as a place of torment where you beg for a drop of water on your tongue. 2 Samuel 22.6 says it is a place of sorrow. Job 11.8 describes it as deep. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 2 seems to hint at different levels in hell. Psalms 55.15 lets us know how we go down quick into hell. And Isaiah 14.9 lets us know it moves to meet us at our coming. Proverbs 27.20 says hell is never full. And Isaiah 5.14 says, Hell hath enlarged herself. If you died and went to hell right now, then you would get out only one time. You would be brought out of hell one time, and then you would be thrown back in. This is where you get the saying, Out of the frying pan and into the fire. And this also leads us to our next scary location in scripture, which is at the great white throne judgment. 
Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. It says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And here's where you go back into hell after coming out of hell to go to the great white throne judgment. It says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The reason there's a book of life there, some people who are judged at the great white throne judgment have their name in the book of life. You have saved people from the tribulation who didn't go to the judgment seat of Christ and saved people from the millennium who weren't at the judgment seat of Christ. So they have to get judged at the great white throne judgment. So everyone in hell will get called up to the great white throne and you will be judged on how bad eternity will be for you. God doesn't forget any of the wicked things you've done. Ecclesiastes 12:14 says for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or bad or whether it be evil. He knows what you have done every day of your life and every night of your life. He knows what you've done in darkness. Daniel 2:22 says he knoweth what's in the darkness. Matthew 12, 36 says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Nobody is getting away with anything. You will answer to God for every bad thing you have done if you don't get your sins washed away in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way out of hell and out of the great white throne judgment is to believe the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, while which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. The gospel is this Jesus died he died for you he was buried and rose again the third day Colossians 1 14 says in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins if you want your sins forgiven then you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ a guy asked me one time how to be saved he said people are telling me so many different things he said some tell me to believe the gospel some say to put your trust in the blood. Some say to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Some say put your faith in the finished work of Christ. Some say take it to the cross. And really, all these things are the same. If you believe the gospel, then you are putting your trust in the blood. You are believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for you and his finished work on the cross, then that is believing in the gospel. Because what did he do for you? He died for you. He shed his blood for you. He was buried for you. He did all the work. That's the gospel. All you have to do is come to him as a sinner and believe on him. You don't quit your sins to be saved. You realize your own self-righteousness won't save you and turn to Jesus Christ and his righteousness. If you will place your faith on Jesus and what he did for you to save you, then God will give you the righteousness of Jesus Christ and take away your unrighteous record. By doing this, you can escape the scariest locations described in Scripture. You can escape the tribulation, hell, the great white throne judgment, and the lake of fire. Revelation 20, 14, and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If you went to hell right now, then one day you would be called up to the great white throne judgment and be judged. You would then be cast into the lake of fire. Death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. It's okay to refer to the lake of fire as hell because Jesus did himself. But the hell that people go to now is actually different than the lake of fire in Revelation 20. If you get tossed into the lake of fire, you will spend eternity in the same place as Satan, 
the beast, and the false prophet, the satanic trinity. The Bible also describes another scary location, which seems to be a, a different lake of fire than this one described in Revelation 20. To give you an idea of when events take place, it goes like this. Right now we are in the church age. At the end of the church age, all born again believers, those who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, are raptured out, and then the time of Jacob's trouble begins sometime after that. And that is what people refer to as the Great Tribulation. While this time period is taking place on earth, the worst time the world has ever seen, Christians are up in heaven getting judged at the judgment seat of Christ, not being judged on whether or not they are going to heaven or hell, but being judged on their Christian service. If they have done good works with the right motive, then they get rewards. This could be included as another one of the scariest places in scripture because the Bible refers to it as a terror. And while Christians are at the judgment seat of Christ, all hell is breaking loose on earth. But after that horrible time, Jesus comes back at the second advent and sets up his kingdom. And during this millennial kingdom on earth, there will be a literal, visible, physical lake of fire on the earth in the valley of Edom. And if you rebel against Jesus Christ and the law of this kingdom, and you can read about this kingdom in Matthew chapter 4, five through seven you are cast bodily into the lake of fire you don't want to go during that time period you don't want to go against what you wrote in matthew chapter five through seven matthew chapter five twenty nine through thirty says this and if thy right eye offend thee pluck it out and cast it from thee for it is pro profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell and if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. If you were to go to hell right now, it would be just your soul going to hell, and not your body. Your body would go to the grave. But in this like a fire, men will be cast bodily into this like a fire. And it's described in Isaiah 34. 8 through 11 it says for it is the day of the lord's vengeance and that's the second coming and the year of his recompenses for the controversy of zion and the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch and the dust thereof into brimstone and the land thereof shall become burning pitch and it shall not be quenched night nor day the smoke thereof shall go up forever from generation to generation it shall lie waste none shall pass through it forever and ever but the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. When Jesus comes back, he comes back with a vengeance. Second Thessalonians describes it by saying, Inflaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. This fire formed at the second advent is what makes this lake of fire. But this has been... The scariest locations described in the scriptures. And there are definitely more, but I'll close with this last one. And if you want to be saved, and I have to worry about facing these things in the future, then believe the gospel that Paul preaches in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Jesus died. He died for you. He was buried and rose again the third day. You received the gospel to be saved. Don't just believe it happened but put your trust in the gospel. Rely on Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ alone is a crucified, buried, and risen Savior. He died and shed his blood, and he took your place. Quit relying on your own self-righteousness to get you to heaven, and put your trust in him so you can receive his spotless, sinless record, and you'll get his righteousness, and God will take away your unrighteousness.